borrowed. Am I speaking to Mr. Howard? The voice rang with electronic modulation, sinister and almost comically demonic. The middle-aged businessman pinched the bridge of his nose and answered, That's me. How can I help you today? He drummed his pudgy fingers on the desk and daydreamed of nights of passion with minor celebrities. I have your wife and child. I want you to listen very carefully to what I'm about to say. Howard felt the prickle of cold sweat on his collarbone and his face changed through a dozen shades of violet. If you hurt them, I'll hunt you down and kill you. In the office around him, nobody noticed. Calm down, Mr. Howard. You wouldn't want me to do something rash, would you? No, I think we'll continue this discussion as adults, not as bitter children throwing insults. Now, are you ready to hear my demands? Howard's shoulders sagged as he whispered into the receiver. Yes. Good man. First, I want no interference from the police. They won't understand our little game. I understand. Good. I want £50,000 wired to the account that I'll provide you with. I don't care how you get it, just do it. Rob a bank, remortgage your house, do whatever it takes. You have until five o'clock. And what if I refuse? There was a calm, computerised pause on the other end of the line. If you refuse, Mr Howard, then your wife and daughter will die. Slowly, of course, but surely. They'll know what's happening. They'll read it in each other's eyes and beg for mercy. They'll wish you were in their place, that you were paying for your mistakes instead of them. They'll howl your name and I'll play their tormented voices to you down the telephone line. Enough! Howard bellowed. His colleagues looked up from their computer terminals and he tapped the phone against the palm of his hand. Nuisance caller, he mouthed. When they were focusing once more on the job in hand, he spoke again. How do I know that this is genuine? Would you like me to send a finger? Even through the modulator, Howard could hear the sinister steel edge. No, he babbled, I believe you. All the same, perhaps I should offer some proof. £50,000 by five o'clock, don't forget. The line went dead and Mr. Howard stared at the silent handset in disbelief and bewilderment. The force of the explosion knocked him to the floor, coating him with dust, melted plastic and acrid billows of smoke. An airborne tyre whistled its way into a shop window where it scattered glass over surprised customers. Howard rolled across the asphalt, straightened his tyre and climbed slowly to his feet. Inside his jacket pocket, his mobile phone began to ring. Are you surprised, Mr. Howard? Are you crazy? He screamed. You could have killed me. I'm well aware of that, but I didn't. You have two hours, don't forget. Howard groaned and put the phone down. Howard was worried. It had been three hours since the last call and he'd made the drop as promised. Every time a car whizzed past or a train rattled by, he felt pangs of paranoia and the greasy hands of fear on the nape of his neck. Then it came. Hello, Mr. Howard. You he shouted. I gave you your money, so where are my wife and daughter? You behaved yourself admirably up until now. Don't let yourself down at the end. They're at your house. Better hurry, though. Cursing, he threw the mobile phone to the floor and dived into his car, racing through the busy streets like a stuntman. When he pulled into the quiet cul-de-sac with a screech of rubber on asphalt, he saw billowing flames ripping through the living room. With a cry of rage and anguish, he kicked the porch door open and grasped the door handle. It was locked and so hot that it seared his hand and forced him back. In desperation, he ripped his shirt from his aching shoulder and wrapped it around his hand, then let himself in with a refreshingly cool key. It was like a war zone. Napalmed furniture roared at him and covered him in soot and carbon monoxide. He screamed his child's name and was rewarded with a lung full of smoke and silence. Then he saw her, tied up with tape over her mouth, collapsed across her mother. Neither one was moving. Howard's lungs roared in protest and his burnt hand throbbed and stung as he struggled with their bonds. With an almighty effort, he loosened the knots and scooped his daughter up in his arms. Fighting his way back through the smoke and steam, he collapsed on the threshold and was dragged to safety by the fire brigade. You don't understand, he gasped, slipping in and out of consciousness. My wife, she's still in there. It's a suicide mission, they told him. Nobody could survive in there. Your child is with the paramedics now and the odds are good, but you were damn lucky to get her when you did. I'm sorry, sir. Howard took a deep breath of clean air and wailed from the bottom of his badly burned lungs, then collapsed as he allowed the darkness to take him. Mr. Howard, you have a visitor. He groaned, immobile in a hospital bed. From the corner of his eye, he could see a shadow on the visitor's seat. Whoever they were, they were holding a bouquet of flowers. Hello, Mr. Howard. His insides turned to jelly as the androgynous voice attacked him like a nightmare made flesh. How are you feeling? He groaned again and tried to move, but the morphine overpowered him. I'm going to level with you, Mr. Howard, the visitor said. Two days ago, I was given 48 hours to make good on some debts. The people I owed money to were, well, let's just say that if you cross them, they don't let you live. So I came up with our little game. 
in the bed, Mr. Howard whimpered. He tried to speak, but the drugs had relaxed his vocal cords and he couldn't force the words out. When I got your money, his tormentor continued, I took a bit of a gamble. You see, Mr. Howard, I love the thrill. I put it all on red, I won the jackpot, and now here I am. I've paid all of my debtors off but one, which brings me to why I'm here. Take a look at this. With a painful thud, a leather satchel landed on the burned man's lap. A deft pair of hands opened it up and threw a wad of cash towards him. Howard tried to focus through the opiate. Those hands, were they male? Female? Who knew? The hostage taker whistled. There must be £50,000 there, they said. That's a lot of money. Just think about what you could do with that. Life is just a game, Mr. Howard. Remember that. And then the shadow was gone, and Howard's befuddled brain raced with turmoil. As the lights dimmed and he swam back into the void, he thought of his wife, burned to a crisp inside the morgue, and his daughter, wired up in intensive care. A tear trickled down his cheek. Life is just a game, he murmured.